last days of November, 1950, 12,000 men of the 1st Marine Division, along with a few thousand army soldiers, found themselves trapped high in the mountains of North Korea, near a reservoir called Chosun. Their leaders had been caught off guard by the sudden entrance of the People's Republic of China into the five-month-old Korean War. The Americans were surrounded, outnumbered, and at risk of annihilation. The two-week battle that followed is among the most momentous in U.S. history. It helped set the course of American foreign policy in the Cold War and beyond. And it remains one of the most renowned in Marine Corps annals. I think all battles are terrible, but this one might well have been the very worst in American history. These were some of the harshest winter conditions that American forces have ever fought in. You were not only physically frozen, you were emotionally frozen. Not knowing how much more you could give and yet wanting to survive. The hardest thing I ever did in my life was pick up the frozen bodies of the Marines that had been killed and their arms and legs were bent in the position at which they'd been killed. I wrote a letter home to your mom and dad. By the time you get this letter, you don't know the Marine Corps has been annihilated or, or we're coming out of here with some pretty good others. The Marines marched up into those mountains. And when they marched out of those mountains, they were different, the war was different, America was different, and really the entire world was different. Thanksgiving Day, 1950, American-led United Nations troops were on the march in North Korea. The forces of democracy, according to the New York Times, were brushing away scant resistance. What remained of North Korea's communist army had apparently turned and fled. U.S. Marine and Air Force pilots owned the skies and proved it by distributing holiday bounty up and down the peninsula. Even to the men at the tip of the spear, near the northern border of Korea, within sight of China. They made a monumental effort to put that kind of meal out under those conditions, and uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> Turkey, minced meat pie, pumpkin pie, cranberries, the whole works. It was cold turkey, let me tell you. The cooks did the best they could, but it was Thanksgiving, and we did have optimism that the war would be over, and maybe that's thanks in itself. The commander of the UN forces, General Douglas MacArthur, flew into Korea the next day to launch the final offensive of what was shaping up to be a short and successful war. MacArthur tells the troops and his commanders that the fundamental goal of the Korean War to unify the peninsula under the control of the South Korean government will soon be accomplished. And he says to the soldiers, I hope you boys will be home by Christmas. The northern boundary of North Korea is the Yalu River. And so his cry became that he wanted to go to the Yalu and conquer all of North Korea. They were just going to go up the mountain, just like cutting through butter, and they were gonna to go to the Yalu, and it was gonna be great. 
I was really excited about it. I thought, boy, this is what we should do. And I thought that, you know, it was in the bag. I thought we were going to pull it off. Everything was just wide open, let's do it, routine at that point. We had won the war. It was over. It was that blunt. Five months into the Korean War, American troops and commanders had reason for confidence. Split across the middle at the 38th parallel in the political settlement that followed World War II, the Korean peninsula had solidified into two separate states by 1950. North Korea had the support of the Soviet Union and of Mao Zedong's new communist China. The United States and other Western democracies backed the South. This uneasy balance held until June 25, 1950. The North Korean army blasted through the 38th parallel that day, scattering South Korean defenses. It captured Seoul, the capital of the South, in less than 72 hours and kept going, making plain its goal to take the entire peninsula. When the North Koreans invaded, they had Soviet equipment, they had Soviet tanks, uh, they had Soviet advisors. The American people believed that what was happening is that it was Stalin's proxy war against the United States. On hearing the grave news, President Truman flies to Washington from his Missouri home. The president described the invasion as a threat to the peace which cannot be tolerated. This is a direct challenge to the efforts of free nations to build the kind of world in which men can live in freedom and peace. This challenge has been presented squarely. We must meet it squarely. Within days of the invasion, the United Nations Security Council resolved to repel the North Koreans from the South and to restore peace and security in the area. The United States was to lead a multinational force tasked with enforcing the UN resolution. I was 20 years old when the war broke out. I knew very little about Korea but I knew we were in direct conflict with the Soviet Union and that the Soviets were out to uh, spread communism worldwide. I knew that. They activated all of the Marine Reserves at that time because they needed uh, troops now, like right now. I just wanted to be a Marine in the worst way. I was too young for World War II. There were at least 2,000 of us, all the same thing. We were kids just out of high school and all wanted to be a Marine. A gung-ho Marine, carry a rifle, shoot at somebody. I remember getting on the train and we pulled out. I remember my mother waving to us. But then later on I realized that she really wasn't waving. She was giving us her blessing as we drove by. 